Trashomaniacs. Welcome to the 36th episode of the Geo Gearheads. I'm Daryl W. Four, and today it's just the bad cop and I as we talk about dataless caching. Just the bad cop? Come on. Hey, Daryl, in preparation for this show, I did something really unusual. I actually went caching. Ooh. I found 24 caches in one day. Not bad at all, but I, I thought you'd done a lot better than that in a single day. Well, I did 109 almost exactly three years ago. Nice. So. Ours was uh, just back in February. I think we actually talked about it a little bit uh, where we did a local power trail and that was uh, 201 in a single day. Now, I did 24 for a reason. Uh, right now I'm at uh, 1,498 found caches. So for cache 1,500, I want to go find the original plaque or the original stash plaque that's uh, down in Oregon. Yeah, that's a great cache for a milestone. Though it's basically just a roadside plaque. It was kind of a little disappointing when we did it. I know, but it's the mecca for geocachers. I think it's a great milestone cache, nonetheless. Oh, absolutely! It's definitely worth doing for that milestone. It's just you. It's kind of been built up as so much more than it really is. <laughs> Right. I, I've seen pictures of the plaque, and I've also seen how close to the road it is. It seems, uh, like you say, it, it might be a little let down. But you know what? It's still number 1,500, and I'm happy with that. Also, I've become a premium member of geocaching.com once again. Now, I purposely let that membership slide so I could renew it around my birthday. That way, my kids will always have something they can give me as a gift. It's pretty sneaky, huh? Yep, but uh, it can be a great gift, especially for those of us who have uh, some more expensive tastes. Uh, speaking of which, by this time next week, we'll have a host of new smartphones uh, on the horizon, including the next edition of the iPhone. And we just heard uh, from Nokia and a couple of the Windows Phone uh, 8s uh, from them. Uh, we also heard from uh, you know, some new stuff from Samsung and from Motorola. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Amazon just uh, released new Kindles. So next week we'll have another one of the uh, randomized shows, and we can talk about that and you know get some uh, of those announcements and you know digest them a little bit and talk about them there and see what uh, what's really exciting. But as always, we want to include your feedback or questions. So if you have questions about these devices, why don't you send them through Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus? Uh, and we really enjoy getting them in your own voice. So please call them in to area code 206-350-3647. You can also email an audio file to geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, and we'll include that on the show. Yeah, we've already had a few people emailing us and uh, writing us on uh, Google+, Plus uh, some non-phone-related stuff. And it is a randomized show, so anything that you, you want to throw our way, uh, go ahead and do that. But I mentioned at the top of this show that we're talking about dataless caching today. Of course, we're talking about taking a smartphone or tablet into the field without data service. Some of what we're talking about can be used to save bandwidth or improve performance, even if you're out there with data service. If nothing else, the more information you can store on the device, the better you'll be for a number of reasons. But Backup, you've been using your iPhone 3GS without any data service since you got the phone. Right, now I was given the phone so I also had AT&T. I just stuck my SIM in there and uh, told it to turn off data, and off I went. I had an iPhone without data. Now, just, uh, well, up to a week ago, I was a lowly basic member, and I found that you can get by very nicely with just the geocaching app from Groundspeak. During that period of time, I really dug into the, the uh, app, and I also helped beta test the new version that's out right now. One of the nice features of the app is the ability to cache a map of the area surrounding the geocache that you're looking at. That allows you to have driving and or walking uh, directions right up to the cache. Now, if the caches are in an area that are, that's dense enough, you can have quite a large map of the area cached on your device. So let's say you have an area you want to go caching in, and you download a couple of caches but would like more. 
if you have the geocaching app, uh, in the settings of the app, go and choose the number of results and push that all the way up to 30. Now, tap the Find near, Nearby Geocaches, click on the map icon, and zoom and move the map to wherever you want to go cache, and then tap Search. Choose New Search from here, and you'll get a search result of 30 uh, geocaches in that area. If that's not enough, choose Search again and choose the next 30 results. And you can see the map zoom out is needed to show all the caches. You know, you can do that as many times as you need to. In one, just for a test, I did up to 150 caches. So tap back, hit the save icon. It looks like a little diskette. Type in a list name and click save for offline use. It's that easy. And you can get these caches uh, and the surrounding maps downloaded to your phone without being a premium member and without a pocket query. It really is a sweet deal. Yeah, now one thing to note is you have to make sure to not use Google Maps. Google Maps, uh, the licensing does not allow them to be cached to the phone. So you have to use uh, one of the other map sources in mm -hmm. order to get something that's going to be used offline. And it does take a while to download the um, data of the cache and the maps. But, you know, it's not too bad if you plan ahead of time. Now, I've always cached without a data plan on my phone. And with a little planning, you can too. So if you want to turn off that data to save battery life, or if you're in an area that's just beyond the range um, of data, here's some steps to take. Now, much like caching with a GPSR that has paperless support, the smartphone, in my case an iPhone 3GS, holds the cache info and will guide you to ground zero because it's got that GPS built in. I've used a variety of apps on my smartphone and have narrowed the field down to two apps that I use on my caching outings. Now, before we get into those two apps, there are a few things you need to get going. Obviously, a smartphone. This can be your current phone or maybe a previous smartphone or even a refurbished one or, you know, one you got from a friend. Grabbing an older Android phone or iPhone can make a dandy second or even primary GPSR. There's no reason... Uh, the f Let me start that over. The phone will have the GPS chipset in them, so all you have to do is grab a geocaching app, and there's plenty of them to grab for free. And you'll need to grab a pocket query or that cache information before you leave the house. Okay, that leads me to my second item. You need a premium membership at geocaching.com. That's the only way to get a pocket query or PQ, in case people don't know what PQ stands for. Thirdly, you'll need a PQ of the area you want to cache in. And finally, you need a geocaching app. For Android, CGO, Cache Sense, the GroundSpeak app, or Neon Geo are all really good choices. For the iPhone, Geosphere, again, the GroundSpeak app, looking for cache, maybe GeoBucket. There are so many others. We can't cover them all in this show. Yeah, indeed. And one of the things, uh, too, that uh, we didn't touch on is you can use tablets to go caching. If you're using something like the iPad, you have to make sure that it has that GPS. Uh, you can also do external GPSs on most of the Android tablets if it doesn't mm -hmm. have one built in. So there are some options there. But one, you know, almost any of the apps will do the uh, pocket queries. Most of them, though, do not do offline maps, and for Android, the one that uh, seems to be the favorite is Locus, and we actually talked about that uh, mm -hmm. when we talked about the Android apps, and a newer one for iPhone is looking for cache, and that actually allows you to create your own map files and download them, but you have to do that from the desktop file, so it's something that you have to pre-plan and actually do, so great uh, functionality to have. It just takes a little bit more work and mm -hmm. does take more uh, space on the device. But if you're looking to truly go offline, it's a good thing to do. But you don't necessarily have to go completely offline. And I, you know, even though I use my data service constantly, I always preload my caches, my pocket queries, because it makes such a performance uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, perhaps you're not going completely off the grid. If you... In my case, I cross the border. Your case, you cross the border into Canada. That can be really expensive to hit data there. You may want to turn that off. And if you get into uh, some of those uh, mountain areas by you, you're yep. probably going to lose cell phone signal. 
you'd be surprised we're we're hiking and find cell towers up here in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it depends a lot on but you know a lot of the parks don't have towers cuz they don't want to have to mm-hmm. you know have the access to run the towers through there. So exactly. yeah, there's all kinds of reasons why you might not have coverage and again, the less that you're actually transferring, the better your battery life is going to be. Right. So, I'd said earlier there are two apps that I've I've narrowed down the field that I use. It's the GroundSpeak app and Geosphere. Now, I tried looking for cache, the free version, in preparation of this episode, and really had a hard time getting around. Downloading a key, pew, uh, downloading a PQ and getting it back reliably, that was, it just didn't work for me. Let me put it that way. Maybe it was just me. So, what do you think, Daryl? Have you used it? I have. Uh, I haven't had a problem. I've used it on the iPhone and on the iPad, and that's one of the nice things is that looking for cache is a universal app. That's one thing we probably should have mentioned uh, previously is only GeoBucket and looking for cache that we mentioned earlier are universal apps. So they're the only ones that are going to work on the iPhone and on the iPad. So if you're looking for something for your iPad, looking for cache is a great option. Uh, GeoBucket is also another one that you can do for free. But I've got both the free and the paid version of looking for cache and had the chance to uh, play with both. I never had any problems with uh, downloading my pocket queries. My problem was actually trying to figure out how to get rid of those, and I finally did figure it out. (laughs) But it does have a a steeper learning curve than most other iPhone apps that I've uh, tried. And I, I... kind of think that that's uh, twofold. One, the uh, developer comes from uh, more the Android and uh, uh, such development or uh, you know, experience side, so he's not really an iPhone user, mm-hmm. and he's looking at it from a different perspective. So switching for uh, us guys who are used to iPhone apps is a little bit challenging, plus he's not uh, really... Uh, you know, English is not his first language. He's a, a German speaker, and you'll find a lot of little things in there that just don't read quite right, and that's why is that, you know, he's relying on people to catch those mistakes and correct them when uh, they find them. Yeah, and that could be it. We also talked a little bit before the show. Perhaps the uh, app on my device is corrupted. I should remove it, re-download it, and see if I can go and and load a pocket query, and get it back effectively. And that could just be the issue there. Yeah, also uh, another thing that I just thought of that's uh, kind of along those lines is some apps don't work right if you're uh, on a jailbroken device. So if you have problems, uh, you you know, the GroundSpeak app was notorious for this for a while. If you had a a jailbroken device, it had all sorts of problems uh, here and there. Uh, so if you do run into one of those problems on uh, a device, you know, on any device, not just an iOS device, mm-hmm. where it's just misbehaving, the safest thing you can do is uninstall it and re-download it from the uh, appropriate app store because that will clear all of its data. You know, In most cases, I, th- I think uh, uh, RIM and uh, the older Windows phones did their data management a little bit differently. But Android and iOS, by deleting that app and uh, reinstalling, you should kill all of the data that could have been causing problems. Right. And it will reset all the permissions and on its directories and folders and what have you. So Right. <clears throat> now, we mentioned those two. Geosphere is an iPhone app. So no native iPad support. You can zoom it by uh, two. But that's about it. It still is an iPhone app. Now, I like Geosphere's cache info page. At a glance, it shows you size, difficulty, and terrain, much like all the others. But I like the way it shows you the last five logs, smileys for finds and frowny faces for DNFs. When I was in the car on this trip, I was... uh, is in the navigation position, and I'd look and say, okay, the next cache we're going to, I'd look at it and go, you know what? It's got five DNFs. Let's skip it and move to the next one. So being able to look at that quickly uh, really helped. And there's attributes. If they're applied, they're shown as well. Now, logging is absolutely great on Geosphere. Once you supply a little info into the templates, the whole uh, system becomes a lot more useful. 
Oh, absolutely. That logging is great, and it does actually allow you to do uh, emails of those files, the uh, uh, field note uh, files. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a group situation, it's really awesome to be able to do that. Plus, you can also take those field note files and run them through something else if you wanted to. Uh, but the other thing, you mentioned that it comes with the five uh, logs, and that's a limitation of the... Uh, uh, pocket queries, in which exactly. we kind of mentioned last week, and it, like uh, G, or GSAC, uh, Geo, or Geosphere, I'm getting all tongue-tied with the uh, <laughs> Gs, uh, but the Geosphere will actually allow you to accumulate some logs, so that's also a really nice thing, uh, and it, it really does do a nice job, and the thing that I like best about it is I can take my raw pocket queries and do the filtering that I want to do in the field for things like the uh, trains, uh, difficulties, uh, you know, whether it's uh, one that I found or not found, the uh, types of caches, and it also has something else I really enjoy, which are groups, mm -hmm. and it also has highlighting. But I can go and kind of cherry pick caches that I want and add them to another group and only show that, but still have everything else in there. But I'm only going to show those caches that I cherry picked and put into one group. Exactly. Now, there will be something we'll, I'll touch on here. We'll talk about more next week. Uh, I found a website that will take uh, Munzee info, put it into a GPX file, and that I can download and put onto Geosphere and put it in a separate group. So I can look for Munzees or look for geocaches or combine them both. Yeah, that would be handy to have that information. But we'll talk about that more later. Uh, one down, the major downside of Geosphere without data is navigating with it. Uh, you got to select the cache as a target in order for Geosphere to even show you a compass. It has the ability to show satellite and street view maps. However, without data, those aren't available. So on the GPS screen also, you can take a picture or a snapshot or a screenshot, I'm sorry, without leaving the app, which is a really nice touch. Uh, another way that Geosphere interacts with geocaching.com Another, I'm sorry, missed that. Another con is the way Geosphere interacts with geocaching.com. It doesn't use the live API, so it's a little kludgy. It shows web pages in a small data window, and the app uses some other ways to get in, like, or get data into it, like Dropbox, Box.net, Gmail, among others. So once you have data into Geosphere, you can do some really amazing things with it. I also happen to have the Navigon app on my iPad, and Geosphere can send those coordinates of whatever target you have right to Navigon and let Navigon route me there. Yeah, that's actually a common uh, uh, option on most of the uh, apps these days. And that was actually the big reason why I started using uh, GeoBucket when it first came out is because Geosphere didn't have it yet. But now, you know, looking for cash has it. The only one that I think doesn't have it that I can think of off the top of my head is the official geocaching app. Okay. You know, I think you're right on that one. Um, yeah, most of them will support Navigon and TomTom because those are the two most popular uh, nav options on iOS. Geosphere can also allow you to export certain caches to a GPX file to share with others. That works really well when you're in Wi-Fi range. Well, and one of the other tricks that you can do with that is if you have something like the, uh, oh, I totally forgot the name of it, but we had that. Camera connection uh, kit? Well, the camera connection kit, you have to have a jailbroken device, if I recall. Yeah, you're right. But there was the uh, one that we had talked about that's actually just a, a card reader for any 30-pin dock connector iOS device. The Zoom It? Actually, the Zoom It, yes, thank you. And if you have that Zoom It, you can actually uh, export onto the card to go to your GPS. Right. So get an adapter because most GPSs have the micro SD cards. Slap that in there. And, you know, if you're out caching with a bunch of friends and you want them all to have the same cache info in their GPS, Geosphere and the Zoom It combination really are nice. You don't need a laptop. Yeah, absolutely. And you can do some... Uh, uh, manipulation of your caches, put together just the ones that you want to go hunt for, kind of like we were talking about with the groups. You can make your notes, make adjustments, uh, you know, especially if you're doing uh, puzzle caches. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff really can be handy. So the other app is the official GroundSpeak app. 
And when it comes down to it, I like that one a little bit better, mainly for the cached maps and finding the cache on on uh, the G on the Geosphere app. It just again, it's it's a little kludgy to me. Um, but I prefer Geosphere for logging. Now, in reality, you can't use the two apps at the same time. It's just it's too much work to switch between the two to hunt for one and log on another. So I lean towards the cache maps of the GroundSpeak app. On this last cache run, I was with someone who had a very new, accurate GPS, in fact, the Montana. So that allowed me to use Geosphere to read the description and the hint for the cache, and then log the find with those wonderful templates. So I suppose I could have done the same thing with the geocaching app if I used cut and paste. You know, I could have cut and paste the, uh, the entries in, updated the numbers, and went along yeah, that way. I would have way. taken a lot more work, and that's one of the things I really, really like on that uh, Geosphere is those templates. It's, it just really does do a nice job because you hit the button, it fills that all in, and you can go. But uh, I, I, I use pretty much the uh, Geosphere app exclusively because I've had so many uh, uh, issues with using the official app just being uh, so much slower that I really do prefer to use uh, Geosphere for uh, just about everything. Uh, but I also tend to not go totally offline. But again, one of the things that really makes a lot of sense, if you're going offline, and trying to save the uh, data service, uh, you really probably should have a GPS with you. You know, again, not just for the uh, better accuracy, but as the uh, kind of backup device. You don't want to get out there and find that uh, you lost your way back to the car and your phone just died. Exactly. And, you know, it's not an easy thing to set a mark where the car is on your phone using either one of these apps. So it's so much easier on a physical GPS to say, here, mark this spot, we'll come back to it. Yeah, it's actually not that tough on uh, Geosphere, but what you're doing is you're creating a new cache at whatever spot that you are, and you have to flag that uh, or something so that you know which one it is, and it doesn't stand out because it's just another cache on there. Uh, so you have to do a highlight, which is a great way to do it. That's true. But again, you can throw it into its own group, it's just a lot more work than mark, car icon, mm -hmm. and walk away. Exactly. Now, we have feedback. Indeed, we do. We got uh, some folks uh, writing in on the event uh, notice for uh, this edition. And our first one came from uh, Nighthawk700, who said, As far as having mobile data service, I usually upload my field notes while in the field, but I can also wait and upload them at the end of the day when Wi-Fi is accessible. Also, I tend to do so if I'm not doing a lot of caches in a day. Mm -hmm. Neon Geo needs the data service if I need the maps on the fly. I know some folks have been downloading maps on Neo Neon Geo, but I haven't played with that yet. I'm starting to play with Locus as it's supposed to be very good at offline maps. I might bite the bullet and buy the pro version soon. And right along in that same uh, frame of reference, uh, D. Vixen wrote also on Google+, I've discovered the offline maps in Neon Geo. Thanks for the reminder to update my areas, Nighthawk700. And I am in love. Uh, I prefer caching in airplane no data mode if possible, and that makes it all so much smoother. Airplane mode for the longer battery, battery life, and I'm usually the only one uh, the only person likely to have a phone with me. Everybody else can have a cup of tea and wait. <laughs> now, one of the catches to remember with uh, uh, airplane mode is, I think, I'm not 100%, but I think it's actually supposed to turn off the GPS according to the FAA regulations. So if you have a phone in the U.S., I think the GPS is turned off in airplane mode. I know a lot, most of the devices do that by default, but I think that's only a U.S. requirement, not worldwide. And she's actually, if I remember correctly, from Australia. Right. So she might have a phone that uh, doesn't turn off the GPS. But uh, they don't want you to use your GPS even on the plane here in the U.S. So no, you, you wouldn't want to receive signals while you're in the air. That well, might damage the aircraft. The problem is your GPS isn't even going to work up there. So um, why turn it on? Actually, it should. 
It, well, it depends on how high you're flying, but uh, there's all kinds of stuff that can interfere with it anyway. Yeah. You know, if you're sitting in a, a big metal tube, you know, flying at uh, 30,000 feet, <laughs> don't expect a good signal anyway. Exactly. But it is fun to see your highest speed at 550 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. But yeah, you, you can use uh, uh, the GPS with things like your... Uh, uh, 3G or LTE radio turned off. You can go and turn off your Wi-Fi that way and really get some improved uh, performance out of the phone. Now, Daryl, I know you've looked into this more than I have, but the GPS is integrated into the 3G or 4G chip, correct? On the iPad and on the iPhone, that is correct. So if you turn off data, do you also turn off the GPS? No, in most cases, uh, that is not affected by turning off the data. Okay. Uh, it does not affect it on iOS. If you go into airplane mode, it does. Right. But just turning off the uh, data service, turning off your Wi-Fi will not affect the GPS. Yeah, I, I understand the Wi-Fi, but I was thinking if you turn off data, does it actually turn off power to that? To, no, it just powers down that radio. It doesn't radio. power down the chip. Okay which is a uh, important distinction electronically, I'm sure, but it, it can be really confusing. And you take a look at some of these uh, phones, and really there's only like two or three chips on there, and then the radio. Yeah, It's amazing at how little is in the phones if you actually tear them apart. You know, you'll have a bunch of uh, chips for like RAM and that kind of stuff, but the actual uh, chips that do anything, there's only like two or three chips on most of these phones now. Yeah, you're going to have a CPU, perhaps a memory controller, memory. Uh, you know, in some of the newer phones, you've got a dedicated video chip. And then everything else is, you know, communication of one sort or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and most of the uh, uh, phones now are integrating most of the uh, memory, most of the video into the one chip. So you have that, ch you know, the chip that handles just about everything. You'll mm -hmm. have the memory chips as well, but you have the chip that... Uh, uh, controls just about everything, and then that other chip that will handle, you know, all of the communications in and out. Yeah. So, so we'll talk some wrap. more. Oh, I was going to say we'll talk some more about the uh, devices uh, in the next show. Yep, and we don't have a whole lot of experience with uh, using Android, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I really appreciated uh, Nighthawk 700 writing mm -hmm. in, because last I knew, the Neon Geo app did not allow for the offline maps. I don't really want to get into that too much uh, for another few months anyway, because with the new Jelly Bean update and the changes that they've had to their uh, map API, there are some of these apps that are going to start allowing you to cache maps is my feeling. Okay. And that's something that's new that's just come out. Uh, I believe you have to have ICS, but we don't have enough information right now, mm -hmm. and there's not enough apps doing it that we really don't want to get into it. So we'll get into that at a uh, later time when we have a little bit more data. There you go. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me oh. do the wrap. Okay. All right, so that's going to do it for this week then. And don't forget that next week is that randomize episode. So go ahead and get us uh, any of your questions, any of your comments on this one, and any topics that uh, you might have been curious about that you'd like to hear us uh, chat about. So that's next week, and you can join us live via the YouTube Google Plus Hangout as well. Just check the uh, uh, Twitter feed for that, or better yet, if you're on Google Plus, follow Geo Gearheads, and you can find out a lot more. Also, check out the Cashamania. Yeah, I didn't get far. Also, check out the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show is copyright 2012 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Yes, really, yes.
Smash Media.